So here's the title of what I'm going to talk about. Paying doctors to provide good quality care, whatever next? And what I'm broadly going to cover is why would you want to measure quality of care in the first place? Why would you even think about using financial incentives to try and improve quality? And what happens if you do? And we will range quite widely. We will range geographically from the UK to France to Greece, all the way to Iraq. Um, in time, we'll, we'll go back several thousand years and we'll go forward a little bit too. In terms of content areas, we'll talk a little bit about clinical medicine, um, pass by economic theory, delve into politics and even a little bit of skullduggery. And you'll see some of the research that academic GPs like me do because I'm afraid it's not possible to get me on my hind legs and avoid me spending most of the time talking about the research that I've been doing and that's what I will be spending a lot of the talk on. So first of all, why would you bother to measure quality of care at all? And when I qualified, which was in the mid-1970s, there are a lot of people who would be puzzled by this question um, because there was no such thing as a bad doctor and why would you anyway be wanting to measure quality of care? It was probably unmeasurable. And the, the first step really was the demonstration in the 1980s of widespread variation in medical practice. And Jack Wenberg at Dartmouth was probably the, the founder of, of um, this genre of work. And, and here's an example of the sort of stuff that's produced. And you can see atlases. Here's an atlas of the back surgery rate in states of the United States. And there's a lot of surgery goes on in the dark states and not very much in the light states. So there's a 2.5-fold variation, uh, or four, sorry, 4-fold variation between back surgery rates in New York and Wyoming. Why would that be? Well, you may, might imagine why it might be, various reasons you'd think up, but almost anything you look at, you find that sort of variation. Just the same in this country. This is, these are atlases produced for the US. Um, you can find atlases for the UK too. Um, here's a, um, a, an atlas of the rate of getting MRI scans and you're not very likely to get an MRI scan if you live in Portsmouth, but if you fall over in the Hammersmith, well boy, you'll sure get scanned pretty quick. So widespread variation in medical practice. Now, this is nothing terribly new. Uh, this, is, this is Hippocrates. Um, and Hippocrates, of course, lived a long time ago in Greece, and, and he noted the phenomenon of medical practice variation. And he wrote, in acute diseases, practitioners differ so much among themselves that those things which one administers thinking the best that can be given, another holds to be bad. And indeed, um, he realized that this variation went across the specialties too even in those days, <clears throat> because if you read down a little bit, he said, and similar differences are to be found in the examination of entrails. So whether you were dealing with pathology or acute medicine, in ancient Greece, uh, doctors varied just as they do now. Now, <clears throat> this might not matter if all the doctors were doing just the right thing. But what followed on the demonstration in the 1980s of uh, variation in medical practice was de the development of 90, in the 1990s of methods of measuring quality of care. And then people started to realize the very big gap that there was between the medical care that could be provided and the medical care that was actually provided. This, I have to say, is sometimes a bit of a shock to medical students because it's sometimes, sometimes your teachers might give you the impression that they're doing just the right thing all the time. Well, my illustration of this, because I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody in Brighton and Sussex, obviously, is from the United States. Um, and here is a very well-known study. It's very well-known because it was carried out meticulously, and it's a very large study. And it's Beth McGlynn's study from the Rand Corporation in the US. And she um, took 30 major conditions and preventive care. She had 49 panels sit down in an exhaustive detail, developed 439 quality indicators for those conditions, and then she applied them <clears throat> to a random sample of uh, 6,500 US adults. And what she showed was that in chronic disease, 60% of patients were receiving the recommended care, the care they should have got, 
20% were getting care that was actively contraindicated. When it came to acute care, a bit better, 70% of people were getting the care they should have done, but 30% of people were getting care that they should not have been receiving. And when it came to preventive care, only half the patients were getting the care that they should have done. And this in, of course, a country which prided it, or pretends to pride itself on having the best healthcare system in the world, uh, was shocking. And this, I've given you an example from the US, but this sort of, um, this sort of data can be replicated in other countries. And in the US produced this uh, very influential book uh, from the Institute of Medicine called Crossing the Quality Chasm. So the realization that not only was there widespread variation in medical practice, but there was this huge gap between what we could provide and what we were actually providing to patients. And so the whole business of, of um, that ends up with the discussion of financial incentives that we'll come to is around the question of how do you close this gap? How do you close this chasm between what we could do and what we actually find ourselves doing? So why would you even think about giving financial incentives? Well, the first one is, is a, it's a fairly straightforward one. And uh, in, in the situation of, that we, in the way in which we run general practice in this country, because I'm going to talk for most of the talk about, about primary care, is there sim simply may be additional costs of providing better care. So if I and my practice want to employ additional nurses to provide better care for my patients with diabetes or asthma, it costs me money to hire those nurses. So why shouldn't I be paid for that? Because actually under the old system, I took home less money if I had more staff in my practices to provide better care for my patients. And that kind of seems a bit odd. But the, uh, the more interesting thing, and the one that, that we're, we're uh, going to spend most of the time discussing, is around this business of, of whether people should be paid, whether they need financial motivation. Do you actually need to pay people to do better? Why don't they just do a, why don't they just do a good job? Um, and here we, we, we're just going to divert into, into a little bit of economic theory. Um, and as you'll realize that coming from a GP, it's going to be fairly lightweight economic theory. Don't, say, don't get too worried. There are broadly four ways of paying doctors. Um, <clears throat> if you look around the world, you can pay them by the salary, in which case they just get a fixed amount of money independent of the work that they do or the quality of care that they provide. You could pay them by capitation, and that's broadly around the number of people that they look after. And GPs in this country get quite a large proportion of their income simply by the number of people who are on their list. You can give them a fee for service, which we don't do a lot of in this country, but is, the, is probably the commonest method of paying doctors in many countries in the world, where you just pay people to do things. So if they do a consultation, you give them so much, and if they take tonsils out, you give them a different amount. And then you could pay them for quality, payment for meeting specific quality targets. And those broadly are the four ways in which, if you were designing a healthcare system, you would, uh, you would pay docs. Um, now, so I want to ask the question, what would you get without professionalism? So we rely on the professionalism of the doctors and the students who are training, but what would you, what would you get if, if they didn't act in uh, a professional manner? And this is what you get. The salary doctors would do as little as possible for as few people as possible. Those who were capitated would do as little as possible, but for as many people as possible. Those who uh, were employed on fee-for-service would do as much as possible, whether or not it helped the patient. And those who were given quality payments would carry out a limited range of highly commendable tasks, but do nothing else. So you can see um, from this two lessons. The first is that we absolutely rely on the professionalism of the doctors and the clinicians who provide health care. Because without that professionalism, we would have some very powerful disincentives and things that would drive our healthcare system in all sorts of crazy ways. But uh, the other point from this slide is that these payment methods give, a, um, give different incentives, different motivations to doctors. And many countries in the world believe that what you need in order to produce the, 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 the best from your healthcare system is some sort of blended payment system, some sort of mixture between these. And I think you can see, if you look around the world, um, problems with many healthcare systems where 
there, are, there are single methods of payment. So in many countries of the world, salaried doctors literally do do as little as possible. They get their the work done, usually for the government, as quickly as they can and go off and do their private practice in the afternoon. And that's a real problem in many developing countries where salaries are very low. Um, Fee-for-service is a huge problem uh, because it encourages doctors to do more things. Now, you might not think that's such a bad thing, but it basically stimulates over, over, uh, overproduction. Uh, if you pay orthopedic surgeons to replace knees, they will replace <coughs> knees. And there's very clear evidence that, that um, in countries where the principal method of payment is for doctors to do things, they do too much. So the notion that we might actually be looking at some sort of blended payment system to try and get the best out of our medical workforce um, is, is a common one around the world. But we, uh, we went slightly overboard. Um, when I go to the United States, which I do quite frequently, they, um, they complain about not having a healthcare system. They can't change everything. It's such a fantastically complex model, they can't change anything. And they say, wouldn't it be nice if we were like you? You know, you've got a healthcare system, you can change things. Well, of course, one of the problems with having a healthcare system is that you can change it. And our governments do change it. They don't tend to try out what they want to change. They just do it, and on massive scale, and usually immediately. So we are to some extent regarded as the health policy laboratory of the world in that everybody watches us to see where it goes wrong. So in 2003, the Equality and Outcomes Framework was introduced that produced 25% of GP's income in relation to a complex set in, uh, at the, when it started of 136 quality indicators. I'm sorry, this is, must be a slide I was showing in the US. Um, one and a half million pounds of extra money uh, was given to the GPs. It was additional income. And a leading US commentator, Paul Chacal, um, from California, wrote in his editorial in the BMJ, with one mighty leap, the NHS vaults over anything being attempted in the United States, the previous leader in quality improvement initiatives. So, a lot of money, and what I'm now going to talk about in most of the talk, is what happened. But before I do that, I wouldn't like you to think that this was the first attempt at pay for performance. So this is um, King Hammurabi, who was emperor of Babylon, as you can see, several thousand years ago. Pretty ferocious looking guy, I wouldn't like to have met him, I don't think. Um, but he was a great uh, lawmaker. I mean, he would, he, he would have reveled in your uh, final year exam regulations. Um, and he wrote down all the laws of Babylon. And um, uh, if you go to, this is the Louvre, and if you go down underneath this pyramid, um, you'll find one of these um, marble columns. And they have got written all the way down in minute script the laws of the Babylonian Empire. And he had hundreds of copies of these made, and they were sent all around the empire, and that was how the, the, the place was governed, uh, including um, uh, payment schemes for doctors. So if you read down and you get down to about here, you will find the first pay for performance scheme. If a doctor has opened an abscess of the eye and has cured the eye, he shall take 10 shekels of silver. So he was well ahead of his time, old, old Hammurabi. And um, actually he was, he was, sorry I divert, but he was, he was actually ahead of his time on patient safety too. Uh, because if you read down a little bit further, um, if a doctor has opened an abscess of the eye and has caused the loss of the eye, the doctor's, <laughs> the doctor's fingers shall be cut off. So, uh, hmm, tricky place to be, Babylon, but I bet the ophthalmology was jolly good. <laughs> <laughs> so, back up to date. Um, I will tell you a little bit because many of you are not, not um, general practitioners or related to general practice. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a few things about the details of this scheme, which was uh, designed to produce several billion dollars, uh, several billion pounds, sorry, um, in return for improved quality. So 25% of GP's income started to be related to these complex quality indicators, mainly for chronic disease management, but with substantial uh, amounts also for practice organization and patient experience. I'm going to talk principally about chronic disease management. So the initial indicators were uh, for these conditions that you can see, coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, etc., cetera, uh, major chronic diseases. And the numbers in brackets afterwards are the numbers of indicators for each condition. And so you can immediately spot something going 
uh, slightly str uh, strange. So coronary heart disease and heart failure have 15 indicators. Mental health has five indicators. Now, is that because mental health is very unimportant? No, it's because mental health is very hard to measure. So what you can immediately see is that you start to privilege the measurable. And what can be measured is what is incentivized, and what uh, can be measured becomes what is important. So there is, a, there is what many would regard as an insidious effect of trying to measure quality is, is that you privilege the measurable. And here, here's an example. Let me give you an example of, of two of the indicators so you can see what it looks like. These are, these are heart, coronary heart disease. So the first one is a process measure. It's the percentage of patients on a GP's list with coronary heart disease whose notes have got a record of the total cholesterol in the previous 15 months. So GPs are, are supposed to keep an eye on their patients' cholesterol when they've got heart disease. And if they manage that for a quarter of their patients, they get one point. And if they manage it for 90% of their patients, there's a sliding scale that goes up to seven points. And points <clears throat> translate by a rather complicated formula into pounds. Um, so you can see there's a clear financial incentive to do cholesterol checks on patients with, um, uh, with ischemic heart disease. The second indicator at the bottom is an intermediate outcome. And this is the percentage of patients with coronary heart disease whose last cholesterol measured in the last 15 months, oh, I'm sorry, we're in old money here, it really, um, <clears throat> is 5 millimoles per litre or less. And point score is slightly different here. Again, only one point if they manage that for 25% of their patients, but 16 points if they manage that for 60% of their patients. So this is a much harder indicator to achieve, okay? Getting cholesterol, measuring cholesterol is pretty easy. Getting cholesterol down is much harder. So they get more points, more money, and the target that they had to achieve was, was lower. So that's roughly how the scheme works. Now, somewhat controversially, GP is allowed to exclude pe people from this scheme. They can say, <clears throat> oh, that indicator doesn't apply to my patient, um, for a wide variety of reasons. They can, if the patient refused, if the GP just decided it wasn't clinically appropriate, or if the patient's newly diagnosed or registered, or already on the maximum dose of medication. But the second one is the, <clears throat> is the key one, which I have to say government hated, because they thought it would be a charter for cheats. You know, just let GPs exclude anybody they want to exclude, but it was necessary to sell it to the docs. And I think personally it's a very important part of the scheme. We'll come on and see later whether they did cheat or not. As I mentioned, there were organisational indicators that relate to records, education and training, practice management, but I won't talk more about those. <clears throat> and there were also some uh, incentives relating to patient surveys and one on booking consultations of 10 minutes or more. So a, a financial incentive to practices which had routine appointments at 10 minutes or more, which is now more or less standard, but in those days there were still people con consulting at regular five minutes throughout the day, and it was an attempt to incentivise um, it was actually a, 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 a quite a strong attempt by the BMA to try and get an additional incentive payment for practices that booked at 15 minute intervals. That would have been a tremendous achievement, but the government wouldn't wash it because they knew they couldn't, they couldn't afford it. So if that was costed out, it would have cost too much money. Uh, great pity. Okay, so what are the effects of this type of financial incentive likely to have been? Well, I mean, I think you have to accept that this stimulated change. Um, here's a quotation from uh, one of our qualitative studies. This one guy kept letting me down. This is from a practice nurse talking. When we actually got him in and it had his blood taken, it was like, yeah, yeah, dancing around the room and everything. So I think that, uh, that um, GPs in the audience will recognise that, that um, change took place. But let's be a little bit more systematic, and I'm going to go, go through these things in terms of did it improve care? What did it do to health inequalities? What, uh, and the other things you can see on that slide. We'll come to them in due course. <clears throat> so, first of all, um, did it improve care? Well, here are the scores that GPs achieved in the first year of the incentive scheme. There was a maximum of 1,050, and lo and behold, they almost all got maximum points. So that's jolly good. Um, the government estimated um, they would average 750 points in the first year. So there was unfortunately a 400 million pound gap <laughs> between what they'd estimated um, and, <clears throat> and what the GPs achieved. Except that um, 
and this is the skullduggery bit, in fact that wasn't actually what happened. What, what actually happened was the BMA said all, all along, because this, this scheme had been introduced on the premise that GPs were providing lousy care. And the BMA said all along, one, we're not, and two, um, GPs will achieve these quality targets, they will work hard and they will provide that sort of care for their patients. And <clears throat> the civil servants uh, believed them, and the civil servants were pretty certain that GPs were going to score around that. Trouble is, when they did the sums and put that into the NHS budget, there was basically, uh, it, it, they couldn't make the figures add up. So they quite blatantly said, we think GPs will actually achieve this. And then when they actually got much more, it was, oh dear. Um, and of course, at that stage, the money then had to be found. But um, what was happening to care anyway? Maybe it was already that good. Maybe, maybe they didn't need the money at all. So now I want to show you the first of the studies that, um, that we did, um, <clears throat> in which we had taken a, um, a nationally representative and random sample of 42 practices spread across the country in 1998, and we'd measured quality of care for uh, heart disease, the red line, asthma, the yellow line, and diabetes, the green line. And so when we saw the uh, GP contract coming along in 2004, we went back in 2003 and measured care before the contract, and then we measured, we went back to the practices again in 2005 and 2007. So what you can see here is as follows. If you take coronary heart disease, care was already improving rapidly before the onset of the financial incentives. It continued to improve and then plateaued. Plateaued either because the GPs were already earning all the points they could get, so why try any harder? Um, but also plateaued because realistically some of the indicators were, were achieving ma the highest levels you could uh, possibly expect them to get to. So, uh, you know, 95% um, of people being counselled about smoking or, or whatever. So some of, the, some of the indicators were getting to very high levels. So already improving rapidly, um, carried on. For asthma and diabetes, we see a slightly different picture. They were improving already again, um, and then they were improved more rapidly before, again, they, they plateaued. And um, we'll come on to some of the things that were going on, because you might say, well, what was going on around here? Was nothing going on? The answer is no. Those of you in the health service will be, will be aware that there were lots of things going on. There were national service frameworks being developed. There were national guidelines. NICE was set up. Doctors started to be appraised in the NHS. A whole range of things were going on. And <clears throat> if there is, if you want to, if you need to, to leave now, if anybody's got to go, um, the simple answer to do, do financial incentives make a difference to quality of care is yes, a bit. Um, and that's actually consistent with the um, literature on what improves quality of care generally is that there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing that changes care from being poor or mediocre to being very good, but there are a lot of things that make a bit of difference. Guidelines make a bit of difference, audit and feedback makes a bit of difference, public release of information on quality of care so you're compared with your peers makes a difference, opinion leaders are important, financial incentives make a difference, and the thing that makes a big difference is multiple interventions sustained over time. Because if I'm seeming a bit negative about that, I don't really want to be, because let me just give you an uh, example of a couple of important clinical indicators. This I'm again using the example of people with heart disease. This is, uh, these are the again, the data from the four, four points in our study. This is the percentage of people with heart disease with controlled blood pressure, up from 48% in 1998 to 83% in 2007. And the percentage of people with controlled cholesterol up from 17% in 1998 to 80% in 2007. These are huge increases. These are improvements in care that I think no other healthcare system in the world has achieved. I don't think, uh, and you've seen from the previous slide, these are not all due to the financial incentives, but they are due to what I mentioned before. They are due to multiple sustained intervention and effort on the part of doctors and others to improve quality of care. But so much for all this process stuff. What about outcomes? I mean, that's what, well, certainly if you're a Tory minister now, that's what matters to you. They don't bother about process now. They want to know about outcomes. 
So um, we looked at outcomes, and um, this is the question we asked. Um, did the quality and outcomes framework lead to fewer admissions, and we looked at emergency admissions, for conditions that could have been treated in primary care? Things that are sometimes called ambulatory care sensitive conditions. If you treat them well in primary care, they don't pitch up in the emergency room. And the way we did that was we compared emergency admissions for coronary heart disease, heart failure, diabetes, COPD and epilepsy with two, two control groups using a difference in difference analysis. And the controls that we used <coughs> were emergency admissions for ambulatory care sensitive conditions, i.e. sorts of things that should be prevented by good primary care but weren't in the quality and outcomes framework. So that's our first control. And the second one is emergency admissions for things that Broadly speaking, people would think are, are not related to how good primary care is. Appendicitis, renal colic, say. And we did this on, on the basis of an analysis of, of all emergency admissions, 4.3 million emergency admissions in all hospitals in England from 2000 to 2009. And what we showed was this. Now these are relative figures. So the, um, this is the comparison here are the non-incentivized ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Uh, so there's the, there's, the, the, there's the line of unity for them. That is the trend for the conditions we were looking at that were in the quaff, and that's the trend that would have been followed if that pre-quaff line had been followed. And what we found was that there was a relative reduction of 3.6% in emergency admissions against pre-existing trends uh, in the first year of the quaff and going to around 5.8 fewer admissions at the end of the period. Um, this is quite a big reduction in admissions. Always, almost nobody has been um, successful in, in producing this sort of change in, in patterns of admission. Let's go to the second comparator. The second comparator is conditions not considered uh, ambulatory uh, care sensitive. And here again is the, uh, there's the line of, of the controls. That's the pre quaff trend in the conditions we were looking at. And you can see compared to the controls, there's again quite a big change. Now, is this plausible? Let me just go back to the first, the, the first graph. Is it plausible, when I've just showed you that there were quite modest changes in the actual processes of care, is it conceivable that, that somehow the financial incentive scheme had an impact on outcomes? Um, I suppose the simple answer to this is I don't know if it's plausible because we've only just submitted it for this for publication, so our referees will tell us whether it's plausible or not. But my explanation, if I have to give you one, is this. I've already told you that there were a load of things going on. So the British uh, Hypertension Society produced hypertension uh, guidelines in 99. Uh, the National Service Framework for Coronary Heart Disease came along in 2000. NICE guidance for myocardial infarction came along in 2001. Uh, more Hypertension Society guidelines in 2007. Rapid access chest pain clinics set up in 2002 to 6. So in this period, there are a whole load of things going on. And one of the questions is, if you give people financial incentives, is there a halo effect? So were GPs not just checking the blood pressure and getting cholesterol down in their patients, but there, were they becoming more aware of the other care that they should be giving to patients, and therefore the financial incentives, if you like, had an effect over and above the process measures that were, being, uh, that were actually being incentivized to explain this drop in emergency admissions that appears to be greater than you could explain on the basis of the incentivized indicators on their own. And I think we don't know the answer to that. I'm sure you will have some views on it. But I'm going to go on. And I'm going to go on now to health inequalities. Because there is a widespread view that if you introduce financial incentives, this will widen health inequalities. Because basically what you'll do is you'll treat the people who are easy to treat. And who are the people who are easy to treat? They're the affluent, they're the compliant, they're the, the well-off middle-class people in nice places of the country. Those practices will do jolly well, and the poor old docks in Liverpool and central Manchester will really struggle. So is this what happened? Well, the answer is no. So this is a scatter plot looking at the association between the achievement of targets in the quality and outcomes framework and socioeconomic deprivation. Um, on this axis, you've got the percentage of, of patients reaching uh, the various targets. And along here, you've got the practice score on index of multiple deprivation 
most deprived practices are on the right-hand side, most affluent practices on the left-hand side. And yeah, you can see the regression line that goes through here. Scores are a bit lower in the deprived practices than affluent ones, but not much. And if you look at it a slightly different way, um, here I've got the um, Quaff achievement by deprivation quintile. This isn't the first year. This is the most affluent quintile of practices in the country. This is the most deprived, second year, third year. And what this basically shows is that the difference between the red and the black, the affluent and deprived, was 4% in the first year, 1.5% in the second year, and 0.5% in the third year. So by the third year, the achievement on these targets had been virtually abolished across um, sociodemographic groups. Very surprising. Um, and I think, personally, a considerable achievement, particularly on the part of, of GPs uh, working in deprived areas, which, of course, I was at the time, so I would say so. Um, how did they do this? Well, general practice overnight became the most computerized um, segment of medical care almost anywhere in the world for the very simple reason that the data are sucked out automatically from GP records actually every night um, and the payment is based on the data that is in the GP records so if they haven't got electronic records they don't get paid so that's a bit of a no-brainer um, they employed more nurses and teams have got bigger and the old model which I grew up with when I trained as a GP, that somehow you, you fitted in the routine checks you had to do for blood pressure and heart disease when people came along with something else, was manifestly one that didn't work. So what GPs now do is that they have clinics for people with heart disease and they hire nurses to run those clinics. Um, and nurses are extremely good at following protocols and getting patients in, making sure the right blood tests are done. So the pattern of care has changed. In fact, some of you has uh, might wonder if you actually will ever see a GP in your surgery these days. Um, I was in a US airport recently and here's an, uh, an issue of, of <clears throat> US news that says um, special health issue, who needs doctors? Your future physician might not be an MD and then I won't labour the, the several randomised controlled trials and Cochrane review that have been done on the subject but not badly summarised by the, by the sort of sub punchline of and you might be better off. And here's a little cartoon from the New Yorker where this poor old sick patient is uh, being attended by a rather sort of forlorn looking dog and uh, <clears throat> his wife saying to, to her husband, on the other hand, his bedside manner is impeccable. So if you start to organise care in this sort of way, you start to hire nurses and you have clinics, just at a time when um, uh, our, our population getting older, they don't have single diseases, they have many things wrong with them. Um, Will that simply fragment care? Will you get less holistic care? Will you... Um, uh, in, in, the, in, in the words of my mother, this is my mother, um, she was 94 at the time this picture was taken, not very long before she died, but you can see that uh, she wasn't put off by a bit of snow from taking her constitutional, and one day she just said out of the blue, there are some doctors who are more interested in the disease than the patient. Seems a funny sort of attitude to me. So what happens to the sort of um, caring side of medicine? What happens to... I'm going to tell you about a, a, another medical episode. And, and um, this, is, this is Archie Cochrane. Um, <clears throat> Archie Cochrane was uh, uh, an epidemiologist who worked in South, in South Wales, um, a truly great man in medical research in many ways. Um, and, of course, the Cochrane collaboration is named after him. Um, but in the war, he was um, captured and was a prisoner of war. And he ran or helped to run a uh, hospital in the prisoner of war camp. And this is an extract from his autobiography. And um, as I read it, think to yourselves, how would you measure the quality of care here? The ward was full. So I put him in my room as he was moribund and screaming. He's talking about a Russian soldier. And I didn't want to wake the ward. I examined him. He had obvious gross bilateral cavitation and a severe pleural rub. I thought the latter was the cause of the pain and screaming. I had no morphia, just aspirin, which had no effect. I felt desperate. I knew very little Russian and there was no one on the ward who did. 
I finally instinctively sat down on the bed and took him in my arms, and the screaming stopped almost at once. He died peacefully in my arms a few hours later. It was not the pleurisy that had caused the screaming, but loneliness. I was ashamed of my misdiagnosis and kept my story secret. So how do we capture the humanity in that episode? Because going back to my very bald figures, I'm afraid, here is our um, <clears throat> slide I showed you before with four points in time, measuring care for coronary heart disease, asthma and diabetes. We also gave the patients questionnaires at this time. And we asked them about communication with their doctors and with their nurses, and that seemed to hold up reasonably okay. But we asked them about whether they could get to see the doctor they wanted to see, and there there was a clear uh, step change around the time of the contract, I think associated with the sorts of changes in the types of care that I've described before, with larger clinics, more nurses, and probably fewer smaller-handed practitioners. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? Is that a necessary way to, in which to provide modern medical care? I've described to you, uh, you know, what, I, what were the inadequate ways of trying to deal with major chronic diseases um, 30 years ago when I qualified. So is this just an inevitable part uh, of providing good medical care, or have we lost something? And if so, can we get that back? Now, I guess I've so far been a bit positive to you. Um, and... Um, I've suggested that maybe the incentives did something to improve care. I've suggested they might have reduced health inequalities. Um, but incentives are like drugs. There's no powerful incentive that doesn't have a side effect. So what about the unintended consequences? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So the most obvious one is this one. Um, in the late 1980s, uh, sorry, late 1990s, people were finding it really hard to get to see their doctor. You had to w wait a week, sometimes two weeks, to get an appointment to see the doc. So some bright spark thought of having an indicator that patients should be able to make an appointment to see a doctor within 48 hours. And the docs responded to this. Um, I mean, docs are not stupid. You employ, you, you, you know, you go to a lot of trouble to select the brightest people there are around, and they are smart. So, what the doctors did in this instance was that they pretty universally changed the ways in which they offered appointments. And they moved to a system which is sometimes called advanced access, which essentially is, is offering unlimited appointments on the day, but restricting people being able to book ahead. Now, if you took one of the two vice chancellors and said, well, when you want your blood pressure checked, just ring me up on the day, we'll fit you in sometime, they would have said, you have to be joking. So, we had the situation that the government target had been met, but people actually found it harder to make appointments. And everybody knew this, uh, uh, except one person. Um, and this is an illustration of why politicians don't like doing live television broadcasts. Um, yes, unintended consequences. Oh, well, yes, this is, this is Goodhart. Goodhart's law is, um, is that once an indicator becomes an instrument for conducting policy, it loses its value. Uh, but just back to a, 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 few more, uh, a few more numbers, I think these are my last numbers probably, because we also looked in a quantitative way at the potential impact of the quality and outcomes framework on non-incentivised as, non aspects of GP care. <clears throat> and what we did was we went to a, a, a database of GP records called the GPRD, the General Practice Research Database, and we identified 42 quality indicators of which 23 were incentivised and 19 were non-incentivized, and they were ones which we could measure throughout the period of seven, eight years, 2000 to 2007. So what we basically did was we said, well, what happened to the indicators that were incentivized relative to the ones that were not incentivized? And the, the answer from this paper, which came out um, <clears throat> last year in the BMJ, was we showed uh, what I've shown you before, which is uh, small but significant increases in the incentivized indicators. This time I've, I've categorized them rather differently. These are measurement things, these are prescribing indicators. But when we look at the same things for non incentivized indicators, uh, we see that over that period of time, uh, and this is a very large database of over half a million patient records for eight years, um, we find a reduction in quality of care for the non incentivized conditions. So, there is no um, powerful drug that doesn't have side effects. And did they do it all by cheating? 
So I showed you earlier this slide, which was the reasons why GPs could simply exclude people from the scheme. And um, did they? Well, <clears throat> this, the, the ability to do this is called exception reporting. So you exception report a patient when you want to take them out of the numerator and denominator of the quality calculation, and they don't count for your money. So the overall median rate of exception reporting is just around 5%. So is that good? Bad? That sounds all right to me. So people, I think, mostly felt, well, if GPs are only excluding 5%, that's probably OK. Um, though there was a bit of a range. <coughs> so in the first year, there, were, there was one practice that excluded no patients, probably because they hadn't, didn't know how to. Uh, <laughs> but one practice that excluded 86% 80, of all its patients. So they are what I think would commonly call be um, laughing at the government. Um, and what you can see is that the range comes down uh, steadily over the first five years of COAF. But I think there's still significant issues around people who say that, that these indicators don't apply to 20% of their patients. So I think the median is okay. I think the range uh, uh, has got some issues about it. And interestingly, you might have thought, when I was showing you the slides about um, the practices in deprived areas doing really well, or doing very well anyway, that they did this by excluding patients, just they had difficult patients, they exception reported them, and they didn't. Because this is a, a parallel slide, this now shows you we've got exception reporting rate on the vertical axis, deprivation on the right hand side, deprived practices on the left, affluent practices on the right, and again a scatter plot of all 8,500 practices in England, and there is a gradient with more exception reporting in deprived than affluent areas, but it's a jolly shallow one. So those scores were not achieved in, a, in deprived areas by excluding loads of patients. So on that basis, I think we would say that the amount of cheating as judged by that measure is pretty small. Finally, I want to take you into the area of professional values. So what has all this done to GPs? And now I'm going to rely not on numbers, but on quotations from uh, interviews that we've conducted with GPs and with nurses uh, during the course of our, our research. And I think it's fair to say that we, we found and we continue to find a wide range of views among GPs. And some of them will be expressed in these next slides. It will not provide the care for the whole person. It doesn't allow that I've sat in this chair for over 20 years and I know my patients really well. You, it doesn't allow for that. You can't count that. You can't count the caring element. And another GP who said, the old feeling of a family doctor who knows the kind of stuff his flock is made of, all this sort of thing is greatly gone. Though I'm cheating slightly because this is actually from a Dr. Brown of Scotland in 1858. And I actually have a series of these, of quotes from doctors saying, oh, it's not like it used to be. And indeed, uh, I have to say that, that just before the lecture, the Dean and I were standing there saying, oh, it's not like it used to be. So you do have to be a little bit careful about doctors who say it's not like it used to be. And here's a doctor who like it. He says, he says, I think because it largely focuses on things we should be doing anyway, it's just an additional motivation to make sure that we're practicing good practice. And here's a doctor who I think probably expresses an ambivalence felt by many doctors. He says, I never use templates. I'm terrible. I mean, our nurses are great at ticking boxes and using templates. They're really good at that, and they, they love some structure. I actually find it quite depressing to think about, really. It just doesn't float my boat. And although I hate it, it's, it's very paradoxical, but I actually think it's a good idea, and I think it makes things tangible and, and quantifies things. And he kind of thinks that... I think he thinks that if he, if he just sort of gets on with his life as he always used to, it will, it will just pass him by. And he, he kind of, I think he's a bit like the fox in this slide. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of thinks that maybe if he just keeps quiet, it'll, it'll all be all right. Well, do you want to know what happened? No, not to the fox, no to the GP. <laughs> well, it wasn't all right, because here's his senior partner talking. Percentages are for wimps. 
I don't accept that once you've hit 90% or 70% that's okay. It's not okay. It means that 10% haven't been caught. We developed this zero tolerance to blood pressures a while ago. No one is allowed to say it's a little bit up, leave it. It's not acceptable. If you're not doing something about it, you need to be able to justify why you're not. When we're not meeting a target, I will go in and speak to them privately. I did one, do one area of naming and shaming. That seemed to work quite well. They don't want to be seen as the GP who's falling down. So can you imagine there might be a little bit of conflict in this practice? And the last one, I have to say, I'm, I'm very sorry to tell you, this is a verbatim quote from a meeting in my own practice. Um, when we were discussing uh, screening people with polycystic ovary syndrome for diabetes, which is a higher instance in, in PCOS. And GP1 said, well, we'll do it if we paid for it. And GP2 said, there was a time when we did things without being paid. And the first GP said, ah, that was then, and this is now. <laughs> So, how can we explain the impact of the scheme on doctors' behaviour? I've talked to you already about professional drivers. This is encouraging doctors to do the things they think they should be doing anyway. Um, we've talked about financial incentives. I haven't mentioned reputational incentives, because all these data are publicly available. You can go and look up the result of every indicator and indeed the result of every question on the GP patient survey for your practice or any other practice in the country on the web. So here's my practice. Here are COF scores, uh, not now, but a few years ago, and you can see we got 94%. That's where we are, PIP in driving. Oh, well, so, that's, that's, so this is my Manchester practice, because at that time we didn't like the depression indicators, and so we didn't do them. So you can see that we scored very highly on all the other indicators, but we decided as a, as a group that we didn't like the depression ones, and we didn't do them. Um, but those, you know, all, all those data are available. And you know, if you need evidence that, that it matters to GPs, here's a page of adverts for, for you know, partners and doctors come and work in practices taken for the BMJ, and they all say what their cough scores are. So it kind of matters to people. So what have we learned? And I'm concluding. Pay performance is one way of improving quality, but you shouldn't expect too much from it. Um, especially if the incentives are small, as they are in many countries. I think incentives have to be aligned with professional values. Because if you get into a situation where the incentives cut across what doctors believe they should be doing for patients, then that's when you get serious conflicts. And so it's very important that this is led by doctors and has to be introduced in a way that minimises distortion of care. Clearly the government made a serious mistake in not measuring the baseline first, because they didn't realise that much of what they were paying for was, was already being achieved. But I guess my bottom line is that um, changing doctors' behaviour, I mean, it's a bit like herding cats, isn't it? Um, but it is possible. How do you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we just would like to have a session now for questions and then I'll close up and afterwards uh, there's some drinks in the foyer for you on there. So if we, people have any questions, I have one question. I think the Babylon incentive has some really <coughs> positives around it. There are some negatives, but certainly it gets focused. What, what I didn't tell you was that he, he institutionalised uh, health inequalities as well. Because not only you got paid more for curing a gentleman than curing a slave, and if you messed up the eye of a gentleman, the penalties were less than, than if you messed up the eye of a slave. So he, he, had it, he was a really neat, organised guy. Okay. Uh, can I ask you whether you think it matters whether the financial incentives are corporate or personal? And a related question whether disincentives might work as well. So I mean, by the first question, I mean, if you get the extra resource, do you reinvest it in the practice or do you reinvest it in your BMW? Mm. And in secondary care, of course, <coughs> one of the things that we're always being threatened with if we get too many people with C. diff or we don't have enough people on the straight unit is that something is going to be taken away or the resource won't be allocated. And does that work? Yes. Um, <coughs> we've actually, yes. Um, I think one of the things that, that really, really annoyed government was that what they discovered from when they eventually looked at tax returns was that GPs uh, didn't invest an awful lot of the extra money in their practices. Um, now, the BMA's position on that is that they had been investing in their practices out of their own pockets for years, and it was about time they went and bought a BMW. But that, I have to say, was not the government's position. Um, however, um, th that particular German firm was very happy to produce the Quaff class, which was well, sold very well. Um, 
we've uh, answered the, hosp the corporate hospital bit first, uh, and then I'll talk about disincentives. Um, I, I, we've actually just completed a study of uh, financial incentives to hospitals in the northwest of England, which have been given a financial incentive which is corporate, but not to the individual clinicians, uh, for meeting quality targets for um, uh, acute myocardial infarction, community acquired pneumonia, and heart failure admissions. And we have shown, appear to have shown, against two control groups in, in national comparisons, apparently between uh, 1 and 3% reduction in mortality. So actually a pretty large number of lives saved, apparently. But again, we can't, we're in the same situation, we can't really explain it on the basis of the uh, process indicators, which did improve, but not enough to show the change in mortality. So our question again is, if you concentrate people's minds with financial incentives on particular things, does it have a halo effect in terms of better overall care? I really don't know. I'd love to tell you that, that um, penalties are a really bad idea. Um, it's just unfortunate. It's probably not true. I mean, the example we have in the UK is of, of waiting, hospital waiting times, where basically hospital chief execs were told, if you don't get your waiting time down, you'll be fired. And they were fired when they didn't, and waiting times came down. Um, the, in terms of um, uh, softer things, there's a, there's a, I don't know what you think of this. I, I'm rather split as to what I think about this. There's a, there's a very good hospital group in, in Pennsylvania called Geisinger, and people want to go and work there. It's a really good hospital to go and work in. And, and they're into IT and patient feedback, so everybody who crosses the threshold um, fills in questionnaire. If they go to every outpatient clinic, they fill in a questionnaire afterwards. So at the end of the year, they can, you know, they know how their docs score. So they take the bottom 10% of docs, and if you're in the bottom 10%, you get sent for compulsory training in communication skills. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and if you're in the bottom 10%, two years running, you're fired. Automatically. So is that a good thing or not? Might be quite good for the patients. Hmm. So I don't know the answer to penalties and incentives. Uh, I think probably that they are more prone to having unexpected consequences. Actually, I was going to ask something about um, patient satisfaction. I mean, you alluded to the communication skills scores that actually stayed level all the way through the mm. period. The continuity of care went down a bit. Um, I'm interested in measuring patient satisfaction mm. in all sorts of different areas myself. But, um, I was just thinking about my last visit to my GP, which was to get my immunizations, injections, all sort of up to date because I travel a lot. And I was exceedingly irritated to have my blood pressure measured, my uh, a request to have my urine sort of examined, being put on the scales and given a leaflet advising me to lose weight. Mm. All of which were probably very good doctors. Yes. Mm. But in the back of my mind I was thinking, and how much are you getting paid? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Would have been awful because yes. it irritated me. Well, even if they hadn't done the weight bit. <laughs> yes. Mm. How do you align the outcomes that we're looking at that are good with, you know, sort of, if you don't give a patient a prescription for an antibiotic? It's very difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 uh, that's a real challenge because, I mean, what all patients will, who, you know, had a, a condition over the last 20 years will have noticed big differences in the way that medicine is practiced. So big differences are the things that happen. So let me answer, it, ask, uh, answer that, well I won't answer it, but let me ask two questions. So if I was to ask the students, what is the cause of the reduction in mortality from TB between 1850 and 1950? You will all have seen the graph which your public health docs say, it's got nothing to do with medicine, it's all to do with social conditions and so on and so forth. Now, in the last 15 years in this country, mortality, sorry, life expectancy has been increasing by three months every year. Okay, that's why the pension thing is such a crisis. We are living longer very rapidly. So how much of that is to do with medicine? How much is due to the fact that your blood pressure gets checked? Is it now, un it is uncommon to have 50-year-olds coming in with coronaries, much less common than it used to be. Our mortality from coronary heart disease has dropped dramatically. 
Now, some of the things are clearly not due to medicine, some of the things are due to societal changes in smoking and, and diet and so forth. And the, the person who's done most work on this um, is um, uh, your colleague, ex-colleague in Liverpool, whose name I temporarily can't remember. And he's estimated that about half the reduction in mortality is due to medical care. So we are probably seeing very big changes in people living longer as a result of improved medical care. But I don't know the answer to your question. It's a conundrum, isn't it? Yes, well, now we have to introduce a, a bit more skullduggery here. So the, <clears throat> the question is about incentives and times of plenty and times of famine. Um, the quality and outcomes framework, of course, was, was um, introduced at a time of plenty when <clears throat> the Blair government decided to splash out. In fact, they... they oh, sorry, I have to digress a little bit. This is an astonishing story. Um, the, in the late 1990s, the public were becoming increasingly concerned about the quality of care in the UK, driven largely by the press, all sorts of stories about poor care, how other countries did a lot better. So, <clears throat> so what Blair did was to announce that he was going to increase spending on the NHS to mid-European levels in terms of percent of GDP. But the, the politically interesting thing was that he did that on television without telling Gordon Brown. So Gordon Brown actually saw on the telly, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he saw on the telly that he was going to increase the NHS budget by a very big amount. So we got real terms increase. Now, when, when they announced that, um, the specialists rubbed their hands with glee because specialists are really good at spending money. I mean, they're really good at it. They got big scanners and all sorts of things. So they immediately drew up a long shopping list and the poor old GPs thought, crumbs, what are we going to do to get our hands on some of this money? And there was an agreement with the government that GPs needed quite a big pay rise. And the reason for that is that they, relatively speaking, had fallen behind uh, other doctors and recruitment to general practice in the late 1990s was proving very difficult. So people were not going into vocational training schemes and it was becoming increasingly difficult to fill partnerships. So there was a kind of an informal deal that GPs were going to get a big pay rise. But of course, the Treasury weren't going to give them a pay rise just for doing nothing. So what the GPs offered was quality. So that was basically the deal. Now the people who were involved in the negotiation, the original contract, and I was one of them, had no idea what sums of money were involved because that was completely separate. We were sort of dreaming up this fancy scheme. Um, <clears throat> and I'm quite astonished when we saw the amounts of money that actually attached. But that was the deal. The deal was to give the GPs a pay rise. So the murky world of science and politics is, is, is very, very mixed up. So then what then happened was that the government then got cross with the GPs for pocketing too much of the money, so gave them no pay rise for several years. So GPs' income then relatively went down, and they got, they got cross about that, or the BMA did, because they felt the government thought they'd been relatively overpaid, and now nobody's going to get a pay rise. So, you know, you cannot <clears throat> divorce the NHS from politics and the fiscal budget that we've got in the country. Any more questions? Mike. Martin, are there any um, comparators um, in healthcare systems that are predominantly privately funded or insurance funded? Because you could argue that in the private sector, the financial incentives are there to provide high quality care. That is, the practitioner is paid directly. Uh, we know that <coughs> perhaps sometimes the systems are, are overused. But are there any parallel studies to yours that in, 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 a, in a very different remuneration system? Yeah, there, there are. Um, they, of course, GPs are independent yeah. contractors, so they are, in a sense, small businesses. We've, um, I, think, I think the, res the results of studies in other countries, and they've mostly been done in the US, are broadly, are broadly similar. I'll just come on to some other countries in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but it's very, very contextual. So, for example, we did a comparative study in which we interviewed GPs in, in the UK and GPs in California. Um, who apparently had um, similar sorts of incentives, except that they weren't. Because the US patients, sorry, the US doctors had patients who came from different insurance companies. And the insurance companies, the payers, all had their own incentive schemes, which were all different. So the GPs were completely confused. 
they, had, they couldn't keep up with what was being incentivized for what patient. And actually, they found that profoundly demoralizing. So, you know, the UK system was much straighter. You know, we're trying to get blood pressure of people with diabetes down to a certain level, and that's easy. Um, so I, it is very, very contextual. And one of the things which um, people are doing now is trying to get beyond, you know, do financial incentives work or not, but how can we actually tweak the incentives in a way that they give the maximum benefit and the least disbenefits. And probably the greatest interest at the moment is in, um, is in the Massachusetts scheme, be it run by Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, which name I can't remember, but has been described recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. There's also quite a lot of interest in, in developing countries for um, in providing financial incentives to improve quality, partly because <clears throat> salaries of doctors are very low, partly because quality of care is often very poor, and there's a perception for things like immunization that you might achieve very bigger, in, bigger improvements uh, with financial incentives, but um, a few randomized controlled trials, unfortunately. Okay, um, we'll close on that. Uh, I think if we could all, um, certainly I would, as chair of the uh, Sussex Community Trust and for the medical school, right, Sussex Medical School, really like a big round of applause for uh, Professor Martin.